uh, we will have two sessions. The first session we will start with, discuss, uh, with discussion surrounding the topic with four of our speakers. And then next, on the second session, we will continue the discussion by picking up questions from the audiences. So if you have any questions, uh, please do share your questions via slido.com. You just need to go to the website, um, slido.com, and then enter the event code digital discourses. You can find the details um, on how to ask questions on the slide as appear on your screen. Um, now, uh, let's start with the discussion. I believe we are all aware that we are currently living in the era of data and digitalization. Data is very essential for multiple economic and social purposes, such as healthcare, education, um, or even assisting the government during the time of crisis like we are facing at the moment. Um, on the one hand, data presents an opportunity to transform our society for the better. However, on the other hand, our data are collected, processed, shared, and used by third-party organizations, which in many cases, um, without our concern. The amount of information that these third parties have about who we are and what we are is huge. And moreover, it turns our private data into a community that can be traded for profit. And of course, the situation raises some concern about how data, uh, how data reshape our societies, the ethical aspect of processing um, our data, and how can we protect our personal data in the age of capitalism. And to discuss such questions, we have four amazing speakers here with us. Um, they, our speakers have also shared their view on many aspects of digital of on many aspects of data, such as digital capitalism, data collection of state and business, political ads in social media, and the impact of AI and human rights. And all of their presentations can be accessed online through Guta Institute YouTube channel. So if you miss the chance to see their presentation, you can just go directly to the YouTube channel. Um, without further ado, um, let me introduce our speakers. The first one, we have Michael Simon. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, Michael is a writer, blogger, podcaster, and lecturer living in Berlin. He is also co-founder of the Otherwise Network. In 2010, uh, Michael started a blog about theory of losing control over data on the internet. In 2015, he published Digital, Tail, uh, Digital Tailspin, 10 Rules for the Internet After Snowden in collaboration with the Institute of Network Cultures in Amsterdam. Um, he's actively gives he also actively gives lectures and seminars at the University of Cologne, Leuvena University, and University of Arts in Berlin. Uh, next, we have Katarina Noche. Hi, Katarina. Hi. <laughs> she is a civil rights activist, net activist, and economist. She has led countrywide campaign concerned with data protection, whistleblowing, and civil rights for the Citizens Movement Compact, More Democracy, and the Federation of German Consumer Organization. Katarina is also a podcaster and writer. She published her book, which titled The, the Data I Call, in 2018. Our third speaker, Alia Karunian. Hi, Alia. How are you? Hi everyone, great. Alia is a researcher at the Institute for Policy Research and Advocacy, or ELSAM. Uh, ELSAM is a human rights civil society organization based in Jakarta, Indonesia. Her work focuses on the intersection of human rights and technology. Alia received her Bachelor of Law degree in international law from the University of Udayana, Indonesia. Last but not least, we have June. Hi, June. June is an independent researcher based in Malaysia. Her research interests are broadly encored in the areas of sustainable development, human rights, and digital communication. Recently, um, June focused on the impact of AI and human rights in Southeast Asia. Uh, her latest academic paper, Digital Rights in Southeast Asia, Conceptual Framework and Movement Building, was published in December 2019. So it was just a couple of months ago, right, June? Um, if you um, need more information about June, you can find it on her personal website in june-itan.com. So now um, let's get into the discussion. Again, um, I 
want to remind the audiences, if you have any question, you can go to slido.com and enter the event code digital discourses. Um, to all of the speakers, Michael, Katharina, Alia, June, how are you? Great, how are you? <laughs> Pretty I'm good. fine, thank you. Okay, so um, the first question, uh, the first question is more like a warming up and to give the audiences some context about our topics. Um, we know that technology has radically increased the volume of data and our ability to process data. Um, it has become a valuable asset in many sectors. Um, how do you see data actually reshape our societies? Uh, for instance, how do you see this phenomenon reshape the way business run or the way our society behave? I think we can uh, start with Michael first. Um, hi, um, yeah, um, uh, this is probably um, a true observation that the amount of data is really has really increased the last couple of years, but um, I think the uh, talk about just data um, is not um, doesn't lead to a lot of um, like insights about um, uh, the digital economy because data is such an abstract thing. What is data? Like data can be anything and it can mean anything and can be meaningless uh, even and and I think it is mo in most cases. So. Um, um, th there are always uh, a lot of yeah, uh, attempts to 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 uh, measure how much data we are losing by measuring it in gigabytes, but it's completely meaningless to 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 sum it up like that. So what I am thinking about is uh, that we should stop talking about data, but um, talking about connections because um, this is really where the juice is really where the power lies is um, in understanding the connections the connections between humans the connections between humans and products the connections between humans and interests the connections between humans and um, uh, desires whatever um, these graphs these uh, network graphs um, the, the connections and the accumulated connections this is where the power lies and this is also what um, the um, uh, what the corporations uh, like big tech um, really understood is um, how you need to own these connections and to grow these connections and to feed these connections in order to have power over the market over um, decision making and so on and um, i would rather like to uh, abandon the talk about data uh, uh, because it, it it really is us from the real issues Okay, thank you, Michael. It, it, it's very interesting because um, we're no longer talking about data, but we are talking about connection at the moment. Katarina, what do you think? Yeah, as an economist, I think we need to talk about both because, um, yeah, and of course, the amount of data or how much uh, megabyte or gigabyte a company has about me uh, doesn't say anything about whether or not this is really private data or information I want to share or I don't want to share. And in some cases, um, people are very willingly sharing information about them with certain corporations um, they trust or maybe um, for certain use cases. But um, for me, the real question is like whether or not we have power, uh, how this data is shared. Yeah, um, for example, in, I'm very happy that in most cases, the um, um, GDPR, the um, yeah, European privacy law, allows people to say, yeah, I'm sharing this data for a certain purpose, but it does it isn't allowed for a company to resell this data or reuse this data for another purpose because you always need an informed consent on, of the cons consumer. And this informed concept also means that um, if I give consent for a certain purpose, then um, a company can't um, say I'm relabeling this for a completely different purpose. It makes a difference whether or not I share, for example, um, certain data in order to, um, I don't know, maybe get advertisement or, or if this data is used, for example, to do credit scoring or not. Yeah, um, And 
for me, the real, really important thing is um, that people have a choice. And in most cases, I don't think they have a choice right now because uh, many data or many private information is um, yeah, shared in the background with companies I have never seen, like for example, data brokers somewhere in the US, um, I could go there and say, I want to buy for, don't know, um, yeah, $50, I want to buy all, all of the data of a close friend of mine and I would maybe learn more about her than she would ever to uh, tell me um, yeah, as a friend and because this is like intimate information like um, what is she looking up on the internet what ads uh, did she click on for example about pregnancy weddings and so on and this is really private information so i, I really think people should have a choice here and i also think um, that we need international laws um, to establish that because otherwise always companies can try to um, um, operate from um, yeah how to explain that maybe describe it as a data safe or data um, tax haven <laughs> or something compared like that and um, that is for me the crucial thing of course it's important to talk about um, also business models because um, right now we have many business models um, for example for social networks or for video platforms that um, rely on advertisement but highly unregulated advertisement as i would describe it um, for me it makes a difference whether or not i um, give a consent to uh, get advertisement maybe for shoes i like or if it's about my sexual sexual orientation and right now we don't almost don't have any boundaries in many countries on what advertisement is allowed to do and what not and I really think that we need to differentiate here because in some cases, I think um, I'm also willing to, to share data, for example, um, yeah, for, for certain reasons, but um, not without boundaries. And this is the problem. And of course, companies will never say um, that they will willingly um, restrict um, the, the um, range of reusing data because of course, this is also a question of money. So I really think that we need uh, governments to, to act on this on an international level. Okay, thank you. So concern and control from users are really crucial to be talked about because people are bombarded with ads uh, and sometimes ads which intrude, which intrude their private space. Now I'm going to um, Alia uh, because Katarina also mentioned that these ads, some in many cases, is uh, highly unregulated, and that's what exactly happening in Indonesia. Uh, political ads in Indonesia. So, what do you think about it? Oh, I actually second what Katerina has said about we need to talk about both data and human connections because. Um, in political context, uh, the, gr the granularity of data used for political campaign has significantly uh, evolved. And in addition to that, today electoral politics has become fully integrated into a growing global commercial digital media and marketing system. And therefore, the increasingly central role of companies in uh, politic, modern politics is reshaping um, politics in fundamental ways, altering relationships with among candidates and parties with voters and the media. And also like what uh, Katarina mentioned earlier that social media uh, as one of the companies, the business model is advertisement based. Therefore, it, it has greater risk if they are real um, leave unregulated uh, processing and collecting data for targeting ads. For example, we've seen that Indonesia uh, because we do not have any uh, data production regulation, it 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 poses um, risk a greater risk because uh, our users are not provided with rights. Uh, it's different with the people in the European Union, for example. They have general data protection regulations, a comprehensive or GDPR, a comprehensive regulations in which they are provided with rights to profiling, right to access information, and therefore companies are obliged to provide the users with data, uh, with uh, uh, information about the profiling, um, what are the contents of the ads that they are seeing. 
um, why am I seeing this ad page in social media also is a form of the exercise of these rights. And this is important because, um, like I mentioned in my previous presentations, there are significant differences in which uh, social media and conventional media are used to deliver campaign messages and therefore enhance ad transparency and empowering users' rights, uh, especially with regard to the data protections, is um, really uh, important in make sure that the um, data is not misused uh, for political purposes, including in Indonesia. Okay, um, thank you, Alia. Jun, you work a lot on human rights and also artificial intelligence. Um, in the link with data, how do you see um, the rapid change of AI impacts human rights? Um, I, I think that I was actually processing the previous question that you asked, so I will just like, okay. uh, talk about that first. Um, okay, okay. In terms of data, uh, how I would like to discuss it. Um, from uh, what I've seen in digital rights activists and movements in Southeast Asia, I think that there are two main ways that uh, uh, the activists actually look at digital rights and basically the digital. So uh, one of it is to look at um, the digital as a space or spaces. So then, you know, the work would, would um, be about translating conventional rights into digital spaces, right? So you're talking about um, uh, civil freedoms online, such as freedom of expression online, association online, uh, or, you know, even online safety, you know. So basically looking at uh, the digital as a space. And the other uh, aspect of it is to look at uh, the digital as uh, data representations of entities, um, be it uh, humans or, uh, you know, their, their objects or cities or houses. And uh, these uh, entities have data doubles or digital shadows or digital clones, whatever you want to call it, really, uh, that um, can then uh, be used to be weaponized against them. So that, that data uh, that is stored somewhere out there, uh, whether online or not, you know, it could be biometrics in some uh, uh, database that's not uh, connected to the wider internet, but the fact remains that you still have uh, that data of you uh, in that database that you uh, can be used to socially sort you um, uh, or profile you or, or you know, to, to affect your life in one way or another. So um, in Southeast Asia, I would say that most activists are actually looking at um, the digital as a space because, you know, that's where we're uh, comfortable in and, and that's where we are familiar with, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, how does this law apply when it's moved online uh, and such. Uh, and not so much about um, the digital part of digital communication, you know, what does it mean when uh, you have zeros and ones uh, in the way you store data now instead of paper, right? Uh, what does it mean when uh, copies of, of data can be uh, easily manipulated uh, to, to become, you know, uh, something else? Um, so, so we're, we're still trying to grapple with all of this. And of course, um, machine learning and uh, AI is uh, making it, um, making the pace much faster. Uh, in terms of what the technology can do. And, uh, and so as such, I think the challenge really is to um, not only understand uh, the human rights part of it, but also to understand what can be done now uh, that could not be done, like say five years ago, uh, and, and what implications it has on society. Uh, but here I would like to also emphasize that it's not only you know, negative impacts that uh, say machine learning or other technologies can have because they can have very good positive impacts as well if implemented properly. So that is a big if, of course. Um, if if um, we don't have uh, governments or civil society or even companies that understand, you know, what the implications are and how to do it safely, then, you know, the positive benefits of, of AI uh, or whatever technologies really um, is, is going to be uh, not uh, as impactful and, and might actually cross over to the area of harmful. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Jun. I'm going to um, dig deeper on each of these speakers. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to start with Michael. Um, at the first session, you mentioned about 
we're not talking about data anymore, but we're talking about connection. Can you explore more on that, Michael? Um, yes, um, I think uh, on the one hand, it um, sharpens our view on um, what digital capitalism is doing and uh, also how yeah, governments really try to seize power through digital technologies, that what they also still do uh, all the time. Uh, on the other hand, it complicates um, the uh, views on several of the topics that were mentioned here. For example, um, um, what is a, a connection is not uh, so easily um, bound to a person as like data is. Um, we always talk about personal data, but when we think of it about uh, as connections, it's uh, it's become increasingly difficult to um, uh, to tell who that connection belongs to, right? So um, my connection to Katarina, for example. Um, who does it belong to? To her or to me or to us? Or uh, what, what is uh, what is the, the who's the ownership? There's no real ownership in connections, right? That also is true for most of the other connections that I was talking about, like um, uh, what is the connection between humans and products, humans and interests, humans and um, uh, and behavior and, st and stuff like that. Because um, when you look closely, what um, digital technologists are doing and what companies are doing, they don't um, really look at the ind individual behavior and the individual interest and the individual product connections, but they um, always uh, look at the aggregated data. So the data is only useful to them and it's only um, put into work when it's aggregated. So um, um, you really can't boil it down to the individual anymore. And um, that is true for most of the uh, usage of these technologies that uh, the individual level, on the individual level, um, data becomes really meaningless and also worthless. Um, and only in the, in the aggregate, uh, things can be done and things can be predicted and uh, you can use this data for several uh, purposes. So, um, uh, which is also my problem that I have uh, uh, with uh, approaches like um, data um, uh, protection, like the GDPR and stuff, because it's always based on this individual level. It's always asking, um, um, uh, um, it, it's centered around the individual. It's always asking what rights does the individual have, what rights we have to um um uh, we we have to uh, secure and uh, to uh, and to advance towards uh, what entity whatever um and i think this is a very limited approach in several ways because it uh, really not um um is able to mitigate um, the power on a structural, on, on this meter level, on this aggregated level very well, as we can see, because um, uh, this is actually what's happening. Uh, the GDPR has strengthened, actually, um, the, um, uh, the power of the data monopolists um, and um, has really cleared the field um, around them. And, um, and uh, uh, it is um, not really able to... Um, undercut most of the harmful things that um, uh, come out of it. So um, I would really like to um, see regulating approaches that are more on this structural, on, on, on this uh, meta level and on this aggregated level and um, to regulate uh, more the actions, what uh, the companies can do with the data and uh, not what rights does the individual have towards uh, these companies. That is also, I think this is an, um, also um, um, an interesting and also a, an important angle, but it is, um, it is quite limited, and um, and I think uh, this limitless uh, limitedness is um, really um, one of the fallacies that come with talking about data and the individual. Um, it, re it really um, distracts from the real issues here. Okay, um, but because there is also an argument that again, it's about data. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, in your presentation you mentioned that yes, data trail of a person is generally without value until it is aggregated with a lot of other data. So, um, do you think 
how we regulate data um, at the moment is overrated or is it or the current regulation is still uh, not enough to protect um, the users or how do you see it? Um, no, I would say um, the, uh, the current regulation is quite good in uh, protecting users from several things um, that were, um, but, but actually they are protecting us from things that really don't happen that much, right? Mm -hmm. So I have the right to, um, uh, to know what data uh, uh, an entity is processing or, 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 or is collecting of me and uh, I can uh, demand uh, erasure and, and and all this stuff. But um, what is this? Um, and, and this can be useful. Uh, I don't want to uh, deny that. But um, it really um, is, I, I really can't um, tell a lot of cases where this particular rights really protect me from like um, a current threat that might be uh, different in other countries. I don't know. Um, um, mm. But um, um, I, I really, I really can't see a lot of harm there, right? So um, I, I, I never saw someone to like be hurt by uh, a targeted ad, for example. But mm -hmm. um, um, on the other hand, um, uh, um, the the real issue that I think um, we can see there is uh, this power of um, uh, uh, of data monopolies, right? Um, the data, um, the, the the power of unrestrained um, access to this data and to also in, uh, exclude everybody else from this data. The power of like having knowledge about society, about um, uh, uh, economy and about um, users' choices and so on that is monopolized at uh, some um, players. And I think um, there the GDPR really doesn't have any lever to, um, to change that. And um, I think this is where um, at least the potential harm is the biggest, and um, and I would really th like to think on this level more because, um, um, yeah, um, that's I think that's what what is over overlooked here. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I I agree because it seems like there is power imbalance among those who can access and exploit data. Not just between, not just among individuals, but also among countries as well. Um, talking about power imbalance, do you see um, data will only widen this power imbalance, and more? Do you see that data can only widen the power imbalance, and moreover, what um, we can do to avoid it? Um, yeah. See, I. Um, what I really find interesting at this current moment is um, a discussion that we have in Europe right now about Corona and uh, the uh, tracing apps, as you may have heard about them, um, uh, a tracing app like they used also in Singapore. Um, they wanted to do the same in uh, Germany and France and uh, several other countries. And uh, they uh, already had a lot of concepts and wrote a lot of specs. Um, and the thing is that Google and Apple also did uh, their homework and they also wrote a spec and uh, also implemented or, or are in the process of implementing an API uh, at uh, their uh, operating system level um, uh, to make these kind of tracing apps possible. Uh, and now it is. Um, it seems like it that uh, the approach of Apple and Google um, tends to implement a decentralized version of this uh, tracing app, which um, I think all uh, data um, security activists and hackers and so on um, agree that it is uh, the more um, data protection friendly way of doing that, while the governments of France and Germany um, are really fighting for the centralized approach where everything is done by a centralized server and uh, which um, everybody agrees on that is the most dangerous way of doing that kind of tracing thing. So um, what you can see in this conflict is um, that, um, yes, it's about power uh, and you can see like a struggle between uh, corporations, big tech and uh, governments on the one hand, but um, um, that it is not really about um, like who owns the data or who like owns an ownership 
ways that we think of and and, and we, we 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 rose up to um uh, ways but more or less who is able to control data or who is con who's able to control access to this data right so um um the google and apple is built in this way that um all the data is stored on the devices decentralized uh, in a way that they them th themselves can't uh, access this data and Now, this is an interesting thing, but they are still able to prevent governments to access this data. And um, and, and and there you can see that, that this is a power imbalance or like a power struggle between states and platforms that is, um, um, that is fought on a level that is not um, on the way, uh, not, not on the way that we you might perceive it like through who has the data like who 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 owns the data that is not the question it's just um who can control who can access to the data and um so um even though that uh, and and when you look only with a privacy view on this thing you really miss the point about the whole thing here and about the power struggle that's uh, th that that's one of the most telling example i can uh, i can think of right now Okay, um, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to go to Katarina now. I think Michael raised important points on how um, should we put concern on the meta level, on the structural level, not just on the individual um, level. Also, who can control the data? But then, um, Katarina, in your presentation, um, you mentioned that data inflicted massive debate over privacy concern. Um, rights therefore rights to our own data are very important however again individuals awareness over their data and privacy are greatly varies um, so how can we raise such awareness i mean before we talk about the um, structural level how can we raise awareness among individuals about their privacy about their rights over their uh, data and privacy mm -hmm. Yeah, I work since more than 10 years in the area of campaigning for privacy and digital rights. So um, I know this is not an easy topic. Um, my experience is that people need to connect to experiences they have in their life and that you need um, really to tell a story about a person and the data and not like talk about the data or, or, or things like that and that's why i would totally disagree to say um I, that the individual rights guaranteed by the gdpr are not important for um like how we see privacy or also about um defending like um the rights of the individual against companies because um, I see this right as a political tool. We had a huge debate in um, Europe some years ago when Max Schrems, um, um, Austrian activist, um, he studied law by then, he was a student, um, he requested his data based on um, this right in the Austrian law back then um, from Facebook. And Facebook sent him a copy of his personal data. And it was not like the data you see today when you um, try to request your data from Facebook, but they really sent the full copy. So he even got um, like deleted messages and so on. And um, yeah, it turned of course out that uh, Facebook never deleted these messages, but just transferred it to the server for deleted messages. And um, this triggered a huge debate in Europe, a huge debate. And I also think that it somehow in the long term influenced how we um, talked about the GDPR at some point, but still, um, I think the Snowden, the Snowden momentum was, uh, of course, more important. But uh, in this moment, we um, saw that in Europe, the debate about Facebook, social media, and privacy um, totally changed. Before that, it was like, they know something about you, but no one knew, like, what are they exactly storing? Are they deleting stuff? Are they not deleting stuff? And now you had, like, a guy, Max Schrems, yeah? You can look him in the eyes and he can uh, tell you yeah I'm, I'm a facebook user and also i think it's important that um when you um work in the field of privacy never do like victim blaming and say yeah it's your fault because you're using all these services so yeah it's no wonder that um you are using uh you are 
losing control over your data because in fact i mean many especially in in the area of social um, networks we are talking about monopolies yeah you don't have a choice when you are a teenager and you want to be part of a of a of a gang of a group <laughs> uh, of your friends at school that's um i mean when you are not on these networks then you are you are an outsider kind of yeah and so i really think we need this these individual rights also um not because i assume that everyone will make use of them but i trust that some people might use it and this allows us to look like into the inner core of how companies operate our data and have like a yeah, sample set of data so that we can start discussing whether or not this is okay or not. I mean, I myself requested my data from um, Amazon, I think two years ago, two and a half years ago. It took several months until they realized um, they are really obliged by law to hand over this data. And um, I got an Excel sheet with uh, 15,365 clicks. And for every click, I had up to 50 additional um, information items like um, where I was, um, from which web page I came, and so on. So um, not and, and this was the data only for 40 months. And um, I mean, in, in Germany, there was um, a large interest. Um, in like this data because like you know ev almost everyone here has an amazon account because em amazon is a huge player in germany especially now during the corona pandemic where everyone is ordering um, like delivery and uh, stuff you usually buy in, in the shop um, at the corner the shop is now closed and um, so i really think that these individual rights are important because um, when we are talking about um, rights or what companies should do or should not do on a political level we more connect to people and to individual stories because we see a bit of ourselves in these stories so like in the case of max schrems everyone thought yeah i also have a facebook account and uh wow are they storing also my my deleted messages as well and in my case people thought yeah i also have an amazon account and and yeah, sometimes I click on things I don't want to buy, but I also don't want to associate with, and I don't feel well that the company stores um, like every click I do for several months. So I really see these individual rights um, rather as an um, individual tools. And I would also totally disagree that people don't use this possibility to delete um, data. For example, in Germany, in many um, cities where you have like high rents, um, like for example, in Munich or in Hamburg or in Berlin, um, the landlord often says, um, if you want to rent a flat, yeah, first I need a um, copy of your Schufa score. The Schufa score is like a credit, the uh, like largest credit scoring agency here in Germany. And um, you are, you have the right to access your, um, to get, of, of course, like a copy of your Schufa data. And this is important because if there is a mistake made, and I know people <laughs> who had the problem that they have like a wrong score, and you then really have a problem because, um, yeah, sometimes it's just a stupid accident that someone with the same name coming from the same city, um, like, um, didn't pay back a debt, uh, and but it's associated to you because there's a problem in the database or someone like associated it with you and you have nothing to do with this um, but then you don't get the flat so i really think that um, these cases are important because even if i don't make use of a right this doesn't mean that um, someone else is needing it and i would in one thing i would agree um, to to michael um, I would agree that the GDPR is not covering everything it should cover from my point of view. Yeah. Um, and I also see that in the area of online advertisement, um, he is right that um, the big player um, kind of um, gained, um, gained uh, market share because they had the money to invest in changes to comply with privacy laws. Yeah. But on the other hand, in other areas, we see that um, things are changing. Yeah, and uh, now it's possible to, um, in, in cases of privacy violations, um, it's possible to give 
panel or to, to make penalties up to 4% of the worldwide yearly turnover. It's in the case of Facebook or Google, it's more than um, a billion. Yeah, this is a game changer. Before that, uh, the largest amount, which was like um, paid by a company for a privacy violation, and this was a huge privacy violation, was 1 million euro. Yeah, 1 million euro is nothing for a company like um, Google or Facebook. So I really think that um, the GDPR is a game changer. But um, it's not enough. And only because some things are not working, this would be not a reason for me to say we don't need it at all, but rather maybe we need to adjust it. And also, I mean, digitalization is, um, is moving fast, so it's learning by doing somehow. And um, I also see that we have still blind spot when it comes to user rights um, in a lot of cases, yeah, but... Um, this one means for me as a privacy activist that we need to work more on that. And I also see that um, especially the debate about um, political ads changed in the last two years, two and a half years, uh, two and a half years dramatically through Cambridge Analytica and the scandal where um, many people learn for the first time like what kind of targeted advertisement is really possible based, based on their Facebook data. And I mean, it was also like the same story before that, like every scientist told uh, to the world, yeah, this is possible with these ads. But now you had like the story, you had a company and it was not theory, but uh, you could prove that this is happening. So, um, now we have also regulation um, in Europe um, or it, that when you see like ads, you can see why am I seeing this? Uh, for example, you can say um, the Green Party chose me because I'm interested in um, climate change. Yeah, so that's why they are showing me this ad. And this is an important information because I mean, maybe that there are um, criteria which are really ugly. Uh, companies are using for uh, targeting people and these people have the right to know and um, yeah so I really think that we need individual rights um, of course um, data is used in an aggregated way but in the end um, people as a, it's, a, it's about my individual rights and what companies are doing with, with my data and um, even if you have a large data set of millions of uh, data points, um, and even if an algorithm is sorting through that to send out targeted information for me, for example, uh, based on my clicks, um, an algorithm find out um, Katharina Nukun might have depressions or something, like something very intimate I don't want to share, and I get advertisement based on that, and I maybe get a category in the database. So okay, that's a large database and I'm only part of that, but still um, it's about my rights and um, I think people have, should have the right to, um, um, first of all, um, be able to see like what categories are put to me, like because that's how um, they are, based on that they are rated, they are treated differently by companies or governments. And um, secondly, they should be, able to change also labels or also to say um, I want to object I don't want to be in this database okay um, another quick question because aside from private organization aside from private uh, companies another unsettling question is our data are also collected processed and utilized by the state um, and how do you see it do you, uh, do you also think that giving rights to individual can also be beneficial um, in this regard? Yes, of course. Um, I, uh, for my research, for my um, yeah, book research, I also I requested basically the data of um, a lot of companies where I'm um, a customer, or I even became became a customer at, at some um, yeah, bonus programs uh, or company programs um, just to collect my data later on. And at some point, I decided, yeah, you still use you should send some requests to the government. Um, to the police and the secret service because in um, Germany you also have the right to ask um, the police and secret service if they have something on you and in the case of a secret or in the case of um, yeah, secret service that they can still 
say uh, we can't tell you that if we have something about you uh, or not, then we know they have something on, about you. Um, but um, I requested this data like from the police in every federal state in, in Germany and it, it took some months and I got letters and answers like we don't have anything about you. But then I got a letter from the police of uh, Cologne and they sent me, uh, said in this letter that um, I'm, my name is in the um, German wide database for cybercrime. <laughs> and I was like, what? I, I never, there was never a trial, nothing. I did nothing. Yeah, I did nothing wrong. And I was like completely shocked. I called, um, yeah, I called the police and said like, um, yeah, well, um, um, you sent me this letter, but I know nothing about this case. I mean, what happened? What did I do? I, I would like to know. And she said, hmm, okay, this is really, um, it's really interesting that you don't know anything about this. Maybe we will check this again. And um, through my lawyer, you have the right to access like the, um, the whole file about you. And um, I, I asked my lawyer to do that. Um, and I found out that it was just a yeah, wrong entry because um, some years ago I filed um, together with a friend from the Pirate Party, we filed a constitutional, um, yeah, complaint or against the new law in Germany, um, which is connected to um, sharing data with police and secret service. And um, yeah, we had a website and someone just accused me on uh, um, doing something wrong on the website, but based on the data, I could really see that um, the um, lawyers or the, the, the um, state prosecutor was checking this and saying, no, she did nothing wrong. This is just, um, she organized the protest, it's okay. And um, so I had an entry for several years in the database um, about cybercrime. I'm not a hacker. <laughs> so um, I don't know if, if it's a compliment or not. I would assume, don't know, maybe better don't, don't, um, that I don't know. But um, I, I would never have found out about this if I didn't have the right to ask um, a copy of my data. And, at this point, um, of course, I asked them to delete that, but um, they even before I, I, I asked uh, to de delete that, they um, sent me a letter and said, yeah, well, um, we will de delete this letter, but they ne never would have done that if I had not um, complained about it. And the problem is I never, I will never know if people have treated me ever differently because of that. And the interesting thing is that I'm often invited to talk shows. I'm often invited to um, like panels um, with um, like, yeah, members of the government sometimes, um, sometimes like the Minister for Home Affairs. And I don't know if they are doing background checks on the other people on the panel, but if they do, then maybe someone saw, yeah, okay, she's uh, in the database for cybercrime, and I don't know how do you see that, but um, I would not then think so, okay, she's fighting for civil rights, but at the same time in her file, uh, there's something about cybercrime. And I, I was really shocked. I was really shocked that um, something like this can happen. Um, and it was even this irony, like I filed a constitutional complaint for against the surveillance law, and I ended up in the database about cybercrime, I was shocked. Um, but such mistakes happen, of course. And um, even, um, and of course, there are also databases um, of the government which are not like a mistake, but still um, they are questionable. For example, in Berlin, um, there's a law that if I register a demonstration or organize a rally, you always have to say like, who's the contact person for the police um, to register it properly. And um, I often, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, organize demonstrations. So um, in, in Berlin, there is a law that um, they need to store this information: who registered which demonstration, um, what's the contact information, um, for three years. So for three years, there is a file about every demonstration I, I did in this time, and I really don't, I don't see the benefit for it, um, to be honest, and. Um, at some point, I also, I'm, I'm not just not feeling comfortable with it, and um, I really think that we should talk about these databases. And I would totally agree with uh, 
Michael, that uh, we um, right now have this uh, very troubling discussion about um, the contact tracing app. And um, when you see what's happening in China and Wuhan, then it's really like this contact tracing app is your um, is deciding whether or not you can um, enter the bus, whether or not you can enter a shop, whether or not you can even leave your house. Yeah, if the the app is not showing a green light that you are not quarantined that then you can't enter a bus. And I'm really afraid that um, we cho choose, well, the government is choosing here a structure, a centralized structure, which is highly problem problematic from a civil rights point of view because contact tracing, I mean, of course, I mean, imagine when you have a lawyer, like it's every client he's talking to, when you have a journalist, like it's every source he meets in person. And I mean, it's, it's a dilemma, yeah, I mean, then, Okay, if you want to protect your privacy, you won't take, maybe take your phone with you. But then this means that this contact tracing app will not work because people will not use it in the way it should be used. And that's why I really think that, um, especially in a pan pandemic, it's not so much about what um, a government will enforce by force, by police, or uh, people need to trust, people need to be part of the fight against the pandemic. They need to want to take part in a measure. Um, and that's why I really uh, hope that the German government and uh, the, that they will change their minds and uh, finally in the end choose the decentralized um, like, um, approach. Um, and even we have many governments in Europe who um, yeah, already said that they will choose the decentralized um, version, like, for example, I think uh, it was um, Switzerland, uh, Austria, and other countries. Um, some even said we will um, do it open source. So, I mean, they share they are sharing code. You could just reuse that. And, um, yeah, that's right now the debate in Germany. Okay. Um, thank you, Katharina, especially for sharing your um, experience in using your digital rights. Uh, well, uh, moving to Alia, your presentation talks about political ads in social media. And we know that more and more politicians are now using political ads as part of their campaign plan. And given the ability of social media to do political behavioral targeting, how effective um, do you think are political ads in achieving certain outcomes? Okay, um, so micro-targeting that is designed to exploit personally uh, personality traits and psychological profiles has been found to be uh, particularly effective. Uh, 2017 uh, study uh, with the title of psychological targeting as an effective approach to digital mass persuasions provide uh, evidence for the effectiveness of this types of targeting psychological um, behavioral targeting uh, in the context of real life digital mass persuasions. Tailoring persuasive appeals to the psychological profiles of large groups of people allowed us to influence their decision making. And as for this, uh, this the use of these techniques, the effectiveness of this uh, technique in political realms is not there is no currently uh, conclusive yet if there is uh, if this technique is effective however this is hard to study because the companies are not giving us ads transparency so that we can study the the extent of the effectiveness of political ads in social media and political micro targeting and what it tells us is that um social companies uh, would not give this information if there is no regulations imposing obligations um, uh, to provide uh, this uh, kind of information uh, to the users as well as the government. In like Indonesia, for example, we don't have any data protections regulations and our electoral specific uh, uh, regulation is not regulating uh, political ads in social media really uh, well. and. Therefore, Facebook, despite the fact that we have highest number of Facebook users in Southeast Asia, Facebook uh, did not provide us with uh, ads transparency uh, during the 2019 general elections. So, 
uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, we don't know what happens because we cannot monitor what kind of ads that are uh, circulated in social media during the elections because we are relying on data uh, and submissions from the public, which is really limited. And therefore, it is need to be supported by regulatory framework from the governments and the initiative for the social media companies to give us this information. And this is actually um, related with the points that Katarina has said, uh, raised earlier about even though data protection regulations has several, um, uh, it's not enough, but however, it still plays a fundamental role in um, make, uh, regulating how companies use our data because especially for profiling purposes before they target us with ads it also gives us the right to get information about the logic involved in profiling and this is important because highly sensitive information like political opinions and social orientations can be inferred by the use of profiling and also because data protection regulations regulates about the processing of special categories of data or sensitive data and political opinion falls within this category, it helps uh, to limit the how political parties and companies use political uh, belief uh, to target us with ads. And yeah, it, it, in short, data protection regulations helps in making political ads targeting strictly up in services that require individual consent, that it, it would um, hopefully decrease the power imbalance between political parties and the social media companies and uh, the user itself. It, uh, the rights provided to the users um, empower the users to take back the control of data to uh, us as data subjects and not uh, to the social media companies. So even though we still need like electoral um, specific regulations like elections, a campaign regulation that we uh, we can, for example, impose social media platforms to identify uh, to disclose the the identity of the advertisers and make the campaign messages to be approved by certain candidates and political parties, so it would be easier for the election commissions to attribute any wrongdoings uh, to the candidates and political parties. But still, data protections regulations, in my opinion, is really helpful in shedding the light for uh, this tran uh, untransparent, opaque system of online targeted, uh, targeting services. And also recently, uh, not so recently actually, so uh, as a part of this technical regulations of data protection regulations, I think the European Union also have the regulations, uh, the directive about the use of um, cookies, especially marketing, um, cookies, uh, and I think that also like uh, proof that data protection regulations plays roles in limiting the uh, power imbalance of big tech companies in targeting people with ads because they no longer it it limits their power to um, um, identify us in um, websites visited or applications we use in daily life, and yeah, I think. That's my idea. Yeah. Um, one point on um, ads transparency um, that you mentioned. Um, Facebook, as one of the largest social media companies, also launched their ads transparency initiative as a response um, to the massive pressure from the public and governments all around the world. So do you think the information that they disclose in their initiative is enough? And um, how to ensure that this ads transparency actually works and who needs to take action, um, actually? So in, in Indonesia, like I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, Facebook did not provide us with a political ad transparency. So it's there. But uh, we, if we, for example, type Jokowi, the current president, and then there is like Facebook page of Jokowi, and then we click that, there, there, they, there would be no ads displaying on that because, um, because we don't have regulations that impose that kind of obligations and the discussions around political ads uh, uh, in Indonesia and social media is not much studied, much less regulated. So therefore, 
Um, it's also important to build like a discourse in the um, in academic uh, level as well as uh, for the government in order to realize that uh, political the risk associated with the use of the political ads in social media because we see for example in the U us in 2016 elections and the brexit and any country that the cambridge analytica has worked with uh, there are several harms associated with their work uh, for the election process in the country and therefore um the government especially the general election commission need to revise our current uh, election campaign regulations to add relevant provisions about ads transparency uh, and the disclosure of identity of the advertiser for example as, as well as to um uh, like i mentioned earlier about the, the message the campaign messages need to be proof we see that this, this regulation is also applied in several countries like australia and yeah, australia it's for example and we think it would be great to have that revisions of elections uh, campaign regulations because uh, considering that we have the upcoming regional elections on December 2020. So yeah, I think it's time to take actions for the uh, election uh, general com uh, commissions in Indonesia. And companies can also um, uh, take actions for this uh, that they need to implement privacy by design and by default into their business model and to limit uh, to disclose uh, as transparency to public as well as public can also participate and uh, by actively fact checking the ads that they saw in their social media accounts so that um, and that they can report any disinformation or like campaign messages that are circulated through their social media account. So th th this needs a uh, collaborative efforts from all of the parties, but more importantly for the government and the social media companies to take action. Um, thank you, Alia. It seems like um, Indonesia, our country, has a lot of homeworks to do uh, with the upcoming election. Uh, well, um, next, um, I'm going to ask June. Um, your presentation, um, you mentioned about data surveillance by um, either by the government or the private sector. And the case of Edward Snowden triggers debate on the ethics of the surveillance itself as the boundaries between protecting individuals and intruding one's privacy becomes more blurry. Um, how do you can draw a line between surveillance for the greater good and those who uh, which aim to intrude one's privacy? Um, I think that's a very difficult question. I'll, I'll try to answer it the best that I can, uh, because that's, that's basically a dilemma that's, uh, that's ongoing uh, when we talk about, you know, uh, what if we sacrifice the individual and then uh, save the collective, right? So, so then we have the clash of cultures. Uh, some cultures say that, yes, we should protect the collective and then, you know, uh, who, who cares about individual freedoms? And the other culture might say that, uh, no, we need to have individual freedoms, then only we will have uh, collective freedoms, right? So um, it's quite, uh, it really depends on the case. But um, just recently, I was reading this paper, which uh, looks um, at another angle, which I thought was interesting, which is to actually uh, look, instead of at individual level of privacy, to look at um, discrimination instead. So, you know, assuming that we don't actually have privacy uh, in, in the cases like um, that, there could be uh, there, there are many arguments on why uh, we're, we're currently in a post privacy era. Uh, it's, you know, kind of the situation that uh, you don't really uh, get to say who owns your data or not. Right. Informed consent doesn't really work sometimes, a lot of times, because uh, other people's data can also be you know, uh, used to infer information about you, even if you didn't consent, right? So instead of like individual privacy, we're looking at in interdependent privacy in that sense. So um, that makes it difficult for us to, to fight at the individual level, even though um, I do think that individual privacy is really important. Um, and it's just a matter of zoom level. So if you zoom in uh, to individual level, uh, then you, you look at how, you know, people's uh, political rights and, and you know, uh, all of these uh, personal um, uh, fights, I mean, personal information can be um, 
utilized against them, weaponized against them um, in the situation where things turn political. So individual level is very important. Um, but then further up, you know, we also have to understand that that's not enough. So uh, like, for instance, if you look um, at metadata, it's just much easier to use metadata to actually uh, find out information about people. So uh, and you can infer a lot without actually going specifically into messages and things like that. If you know who is talking to who, where this person was, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth, you can actually infer a lot of information that can be used already. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, moving back to my point on uh, a post-privacy kind of scenario. Um, one useful way possibly to look at it is that um, we can actually look um, at the situation as a matter of discrimination. So, you know, your, your data is out there, but that data cannot be used to discriminate against you whether you know positively or negatively and if you look at this um, then it becomes a larger issue of justice and not so much uh, at the individual level so i don't know if that gives you some sort of um, answer like in, in the sense that uh, we have to kind of accept that the data is out there but how can we not uh, how can we protect people against um, being biased you know being victims of bias, uh, and how do we actually protect people of not even being within that data set uh, to begin with? And uh, you know, then it becomes a matter of access, which uh, in in the current situation in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, particularly, it, it is actually also an equal problem of not having the access to your own data, not having the access to you know. Um, actually having your data in, you know, when um, all these policy decisions are actually made uh, based on data, you know, as, as you were saying, contact tracing doesn't work if, you know, people don't opt in. So it's kind of case by case. Uh, I think that we actually really need to look at discrimination um, more than privacy in that sense. Um, thank you, Jun. And, um... Yeah, talking about Southeast Asian countries, I think more and more Southeast Asian countries formulate regulations on data governance, um, mm. which I hope can, um, you know, protect people from being victim of bias that you mentioned earlier. But um, to my understanding, only few of uh, this regulation discuss the context of AI. Uh, while we know that um, we, we are facing rapid change of technology at the moment. Um, so in your opinion, what is the importance of regulating AI um, in human rights context, for instance? Um, the re regulations on data will definitely impact upon um, AI itself because it's built on data, right? So even if you have the best algorithms, you will not have um, a very good output if you didn't have good data to train it with. So uh, in order to reap positive benefits from AI, you need to actually give it first um, good data. So cleaned up data, uh, data that is complete, that is uh, local, you know, to, to the situation, and that will actually give you the outputs that you're, you're looking for. So, I mean, so meaning to say it's not only the regulation in, you know, uh, stopping people from using uh, the data, but, but uh, in, in terms of how, how do we make it compatible, you know, how do we make uh, uh, this data uh, not monopolized, for instance, all of these issues need to fall into data governance. Whereas um, the governance of AI uh, would, I think, in a way, is, is also kind of difficult because we're not actually the main producers of AI uh, technologies. So um, we're, we're mainly importing from the US and from China and uh, uh, to a lesser degree other countries. But in our Southeast Asia, even, we're, even though we're trying to grow um, our AI sector, it's still quite you know, uh, small. Um, and, and Singapore probably has the best ecosystem that we have. So they have already uh, come up with a fairly good um, governance model. It looks at uh, the pos uh, possible harms. It looks at at what point you need to have humans uh, in decision making. It looks at uh, how do you talk to your stakeholders? How do you uh, kind of um, incorporate your corporate values <laughs> into AI? Which I found to be also a little bit 
corporate, you know, uh, if, if we need to fall back on corporate values, I mean, uh, we, we need to make sure that the corporate values will actually have the, the uh, adequate, adequate, you know, um, uh, altruism or whatever you call it, uh, to not exploit, you know, uh, your, your, your technologies in that sense. So, so yeah, did, did that answer your question? <laughs> Oh, sorry, I forgot to unmute the mic. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, June, for um, your clarification. Um, we're going to move to the second session here because we've already had um, some questions on Slido. Uh, I think I'm going yeah. to start with the first questions. Um, uh, I think it's for Michael. Um, the question is Facebook or other big social media platforms always set their company persona as a medium of freedom of expression. Uh, yet their advertising business model not transparent. So what do you think uh, about it? The ways company get the data freely from users is supposed to be implemented on how they process and monetize the data? Um, can you repeat the last part of the question? Oh, OK, um, so how do you think about the ways company get the data freely from users um is it supposed to be implemented on how they process and monet monetize the data um how they get the data um, is the question yes i think um it's more about the um contradiction between um facebook uh, between social media what they do and how they claim themselves because social media always say that they are just the intermediaries um and they are supporting the freedom of expression well at the same time they are also extracting users data so um what do you think about it? How do you see this company get data freely from users and how they supposed to um, implement the ethics on the way they process and monetize, uh, monetize the data? OK, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, um, I, I wouldn't think of that as opposites, right? Uh, so um, they can uh, gather data and uh, have a business model and also pro mode uh, uh, freedom of expression that um, I don't see like uh, this is not not not, op not opposing to each other uh, on the other hand um, uh, I think it's uh, totally um, understandable to, um, uh, to to have doubts about um, the ethical um, uh, mission that the social media companies give themselves um, and uh, we should always be qu quite critical to it um, I um, personally do think that Mark Zuckerberg thinks that he is a big promoter of um, freedom of speech and other civil rights, um, though I think that um, we all tell ourselves some stories how to justify our, um, <laughs> our behavior, right? So um, I, I think um, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, space to scrutinize that. Um, and um, yes, um, I think that's all I have to say to that question. Thank you, uh, Michael. Katarina, do you have something to add to response to this question? <clears throat> yeah, just one interesting fun fact. I mean, um, there was a time when Mark Zuckerberg uh, told the world that uh, privacy is like an old concept of the old world and now in the digitalized world we should see uh, things differently. Um, we should always remember that we are talking about a man who bought like um, most areas around his house so no one can look um, over um, the fence into his garden because he wants to have privacy for himself and his family and I think this story really makes clear what's like one of the main problems from my point of view. Um, I mean, we are right now talking about a time when um, things are changing in a so dramatic way in so many areas that um, I feel that privacy will be something for the wealthy in some years. Yeah, and especially in some areas like um, um, health insurance, we see companies that um, say, for example, um, you just transfer me the data about how many steps you made today and 
like every day and maybe we'll give you a discount yeah and for me like it's a, maybe it's luxury problem if i want to um, have this discount or not but for some people this will be maybe um the only health insurance they can afford and in the us we right now already have the situation we have insurance companies um for like um dental um, additional service and they give you an electronic toothbrush and say um, yeah this toothbrush is transferring the data whether or not you are brushing your teeth properly and based on that you you might get a yeah based on that you will get um your bill and yeah this is this is the fear i have like these double standards you know mark zuckerberg what's privacy for himself but what about the world and this is like that's why um, I think that this is like something we should really fight for. Okay. Um, well, uh, the next questions, I think um, it's for June. Uh, the question is, in the event of pandemic, how far it is acceptable for the government to utilize citizens' personal data? Um, well, it seems that what, what we've seen around the world is that uh, the governments who are actually doing a lot of contact tracing uh, are the ones who are able to save lives. So, you know, in such a situation, it seems very difficult to say, no, uh, we, we want people's um, uh, data for only themselves, right? Um, but I think that there should be safeguards. Uh, and we, um, we were just discussing just now on how it can be decentralized, it can be centralized, you know, how do we deal with um, the, the, the details, which are really the, the important parts. So um, I, I, I would definitely go for saving lives. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, I, I think that uh, it's case by case, and this happens to be a case that we do need data to save people's lives. Thank you. Um, other speakers, Michael, do you have something to add to answer the questions? I have something to add, if, you, if I can. Yes, Alia, please. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this discussions about uh, pandemic and privacy, especially with regard to the contact tracing, is really interesting because um, recently um, we had this discussions about the Indonesian's contact tracing app called Peduli Lindungi. It's quite similar with the, uh, the Trace Together in Singapore, but the, the uh, types of data that are collected by the government and the way they are collecting the data is different. For example, in, in Singapore, the data is decentralized and stored localized in the uh, phones, uh, the user's phone, as well as in Indonesia. Uh, the data is collected by the government and it's centralized. And the types of data is also uh, different that are the collected. Uh, the Indonesian government even collected the location data as well. Uh, and um, I think this, if the question is, uh, to an extent that the government can uh, collect the personal data in the times during pandemic. I think there, uh, like what June mentioned earlier about the, the existence of safeguards, because the collecting of data um, in times of pandemic, uh, and even especially if the data is centralized, it has a risk uh, to privacy uh, of the citizens. And therefore, there needs to be a safeguard because it's because it's the limitations of our privacy right. Therefore, it has to meet the requirements of the limitations under international human rights law. It needs to be prescribed by law and it needs to pursue legitimate aim as well as needs to be necessary. And the last elements, uh, it's really important to um, Consider which data is necessary to uh, to in order to do the contact tracing, and we are in opinion of uh, that collecting location data uh, as in a real time basis is not necessary to uh, to conduct the contact tracing because it can be easily uh, misused by the government or the uh, parties that is uh, collecting the data. And this is the case in Indonesia as well, because um, we are uh, 
putting forward several recommendations about it that the data need to be localized and decentralized like what Katarina and Michael mentioned earlier as well as only um, collecting the data that is necessary strictly necessary and the uh, collection of data needs to be temporary as well so after the pandemic the government needs to delay all of the, all of the data because it has served no purpose uh, because the purpose is to, to do contact tracing and uh, this is why a data protection regulations is important because it provides us with the guidance in which what what are what what can be done and what cannot be done and because we don't have one yet in Indonesia therefore the government is left clueless with with regard to how we should uh, do the um, privacy protections in the applications the, the application does not even does not have a privacy policy so it's it's really uh, concerning uh, and also we raise about the the questions about uh, the effectiveness of the um, application itself because several research has showed that contact tracing is more effective in early stage of the pandemic and not when it's already spread throughout the country so it's and it's also need to be followed up by a manual um people calling up the uh, the uh, the people uh, the contact tracing list as well as the uh, testing capability of the country and the fact that Indonesia is one of the worst country in terms of uh, uh, testing capability makes it worse so we are there are a lot of issues um, circulating around the effectiveness of the application and I'm I think that the government needs to consider that as well before um, making an application to track citizens thank you alia um very comprehensive explanation um on the questions um there is another question um yeah, let me read it talking about zoom and other video conference platform is this more about breach of security or data um is this is the case of Zoom are more about breach of security or privacy and data protection? Um, any speakers want to give your thoughts on the questions? So in the case of Zoom, uh, is it more on the case of cybersecurity or more on the privacy and data protection? I think I, I can uh, give a yeah. okay. So, um, the the security um, part of the data is also part of the data protections itself so therefore if the questions is uh is it more of a data breach of a privacy and data protection matter i think it's both because um like i said earlier privacy and data protections includes the integrity of the data or the security of the data therefore it, it it needs to have um, dis discussions about the the discussion of security means a secure uh, the discussions about the privacy and data protections. Thank you, Alia. So it's matters of both, <laughs> then. Uh, okay. Uh, next questions. Um, I think this one is for Katarina, because the question is what approach should be taken towards users to be more aware of their data, but also bearing in mind that data flow also unlocks beneficial features of users. Oh, sorry, also unlock beneficial features for users. Yeah, um, I mean, campaigning for privacy is really a, a very difficult thing because you can't see that data you can't feel um, a loss of privacy in many cases and often if you feel it then maybe it's too late um, but i think june made a very interesting um point when um she said that um at one hand we have like um the well how to how to place it uh, or how to, how to say it um I mean, you always need to tell a story. You need to tell a story not only about the individual, but also about the collective and how this is connected. Like, for example, if we have like this one student who uh, had a Facebook account and requested his data, Max Schrems from Austria, then um, what does it mean if 
the whole of society consists of Max Schrems and this is like the, con this is the data you see. And I really think that campaigning for privacy really also means like revealing what's in there. I mean, the Cambridge Analytica case, we knew before that um, there were companies like that, which were doing stuff like that. But I mean, it's one thing to know some, there is someone who does things like that and something completely different when you have like an insider who's talking. And I really think that we need more whistleblowers revealing illegal practices in companies. Um, and I'm really glad that there are people actually working in the IT departments who, who see this really as a moral duty also to inform uh, people about what's happening. Uh, and I mean, in the case of Cambridge Analytica, this was highly illegal what they were doing in, in some cases at least. And um, I mean, the, the second part of the question, can you repeat it again, please? The second, yeah, okay, sorry. The second part of the question is um, how to raise uh, awareness among users uh, that data is beneficial, but also, uh, yeah. That is beneficial, but at the same time also dangerous, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, um, I mean, that's what June was um, talking about in the case of discrimination. I'm right working on my um, the next episode of my podcast, and it's about uh, discrimination through technology. And I talked to very, very, um, in fact, almost uh, only women <laughs> who are working with uh, artificial intelligence. And um, they had very interesting cases about um, how um, data could be used in a positive way. For example, um, um, when you have like a wheelchair, an automatic an electronic wheelchair, there is an artificial and an AI who, which is um, yeah, program, well, which is um, working this way that um, she's informing the user if you are um, not even, and you are likely to um, fall, yeah, or fall down, so you can prevent maybe accidents. But on the other hand, there were also like AIs um, which were um, sorting out um, people who were um, applying for a job uh, based on gender, yeah, discrimination based on gender. And in the US, you had um, software which was um, recommending judges how to. Um, decide in certain cases and um, journalists found out that it's very likely that um, this um, software is uh, discriminating um, black people based on social demographic data. And um, so I really think that we need to see both um, at the same time in order to make a good informed choice as a society. I'm um, always a bit um, annoyed by um, debates about privacy where people do kind of victim blaming and say yeah well if you are so uh, fighting for privacy why do you have a smartphone why do we even go on the internet hey you are on facebook like why why can someone like you complain and i say yeah because i'm on facebook i'm complaining because this is like i mean we are talking about monopolies you don't have a choice in, in many cases yeah if you want um, to reach out to people so um, I think this is a very interesting part. But for me, this is really about also transparency because often for in many subjects, we are really in the dark. I mean, the question was in many cases, data is benefiting us. And I would totally agree when we talk, for example, about um, open data, which is um, in many cases, you have like benefits through data um, with data, which is not personalized, which is not connected to, which is like rather statistical data. And um, in this context of um, data, which can be connected to an individual, um, there we really have to have this debate, like what are the benefits, but also what are the risks. And the problem I see right now is that, especially when we are talking about artificial intelligence, but oh, sorry, like almost every other aspect of digitalization, I see many IT guys, like in many cases, guys who are deciding about like um, how to do things or like they even um, decide about the model, like the underlying uh, assumption that um, is deciding about whether or not a software is taking decision in this or another way. Um, 
but they are often biased. Yeah, sometimes you have a gender bias, sometimes you have a religious bias or a racial bias, and um, I only see, or I almost I see very often that only I, people working in IT are taking this decision. But we need people who are um, sociologists, who are um, studied psychology, who know a lot about um, the human being and not only about IT, because digitalization is not about IT, or it's also about IT, but um, not only. It's uh, in fact about the human being, and we should not. I mean, sometimes I have the impression that the whole Silicon Valley uh, bubble is uh, acting as if there was uh, no science the last uh, several hundred years before about um, how society works, how politics works, um, what is good for us and not. Right. Um, we still have many asking questions here, but one last I, question. I think that. Yeah. Yes, June. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I just wanted to add a little bit on the yes. question. I think. Sure. Uh, I think that basically we we are um, storytelling creatures, so uh, I, I think that uh, we tell stories to make people understand what is uh, uh, what what are the dangers of things. So one of the stories that we've been always telling is about the Big Brother, right? About uh, 1984, about Big, Big Brother, about how your data can be used against you to change your thoughts and all of that. And of course, there are other narratives as well. So like, for instance, if uh, we want to talk about the importance of, of, uh, of data being accurate or, or you know, uh, being able to trace your own data to where it was from and all that, uh, and you can then think about um, the trial from Kafka, where uh, we, we then talk about how this guy wakes up one day and then he's being labeled as a criminal because of a paper somewhere in some database. And he, he spends the entire story looking for that database and he never finds it, right? So, spoiler, sorry. But um, in any case, uh, we need to um, expand our range of narratives. We need to tell the story better in, in the sense that uh, um, we, we cannot only look at uh, the Big Brother narrative. That's that's my main point, I guess, um, to, to this, on, on how we actually need to uh, uh, increase awareness by telling stories. Yeah. Um, I, I want to also to jump into this because I uh, totally agree with uh, June and uh, with a lot of things she said also before and uh, have a reconnecting problem okay do you do you understand me still yes 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 okay, i okay, can okay, still hear okay, you michael okay, okay. I, I had connection problems okay so uh, one particular thing that i um uh, found interesting in the um uh, discrimination uh, uh, discrimin uh, discrimination and also about who is included into databases um, that decisions are based on right so um, uh, she she was also talking about um, data colonialism where um, IT firms especially like uh, in Asian or developing countries um, are uh, using data from the West in order to um, at uh, to in, in order to make decisions on a, a whole different society and um, and the society uh, itself and and the decisions that are made on AI are often not based on uh, data of, of um, like poor people who don't have a smartphone and so on. So um, what I'm seeing here is that you can yes you can see different levels um, the individual level and the collective level where you can. Um, uh, where, where you can problematize um, AI and data collection, but they are often opposed to each other, right? So the individual data uh, protection angle always um, assumes that being in a database is um, bad in a way, right? So um, uh, the individual um, always is opposed to being, uh, on the individual and privacy level, you are always opposed to be on the database. But on a discriminatory level, a level it, can all, uh, it can also be the opposite, right? So um, not being part of a database, not being recognized in, uh, in, in a data surveillance program can mean 
can have really severe consequences against you, right? Because um, uh, your um, situation is not considered in the decision that are based on this uh, AI thing. And, um, and, and that's what interests me because um, this uh, uh, different level when you look at the uh, on, at the uh, at the aggregate level at the um, decision level at the connection level as i said or, or the graph level then you ha you really have um different um questions and the the question of data privacy can really be opposed um uh, to uh, can can really against your benefit really um uh, in some cases um, that's what I wanted to add at that point, especially when it comes to discrimination. Well, um, thank you, Michael. I think um, we have answered almost all the questions here. And since it's um, already 40 minutes past 3 p.m. Jarapas time, so uh, we have finally come to the end of this session. I think we um, are talking about many interesting um, issues here. We, we see two ways to see data protection from individual level and also meta level and structural level, who is able to control our data. We are also discussing about individual rights and collective freedom. We're also discussing about how to empower people to have more informed choice about their rights and privacy, as well as how to expand narratives to uh, raise awareness about data um, and privacy. But um, before we say goodbye and wrap up the session, I'd like to ask all of our speakers to give your closing statement in two or three um, sentences. We're not going to um, conclude the discussion, but what is the key points that you would like to um, highlight from the discussion today. Sorry, June. Uh, yes. Do you have something to um, add? Actually, sorry. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, since we have a bit of time, uh, I was, I was going to ask a question myself uh, uh, to Michael, if it's, it's OK. Uh, is, do we, can we do that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, okay, so, so I, just, I watched the lecture. It was very, very interesting about digital capitalism. And um, I agreed with many points. Um, and my question is, um, towards the end, uh, when we're talking about now that we have a, a completely different monster, you know, that is not capitalism, it's not socialism, it's not communism, it's not anarchism, whatever ism it is, um, we have a new monster. So I... Uh, oh, um, is this better? Yeah, it's better. Hello? Yeah. June, yeah, I can still hear Hello? your voice. Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry. Do you do you get what I was saying? Okay. So uh did, do you get the whole question up till now? No, no, no. I I didn't get the question. What, what was anyway, the question? Anyway, uh, the point is um I see. Okay, sorry. So what I was gonna ask is towards the end of your presentation, Michael. Uh, when you're talking about a new monster, uh, this um, now uh, this thing that is not capitalism, is not communism, is not socialism, is nothing that we know, right? Uh, and and the, the the question that I have is how how do you see our institutions um, adapting to this monster? Sure. If we don't even have it for it, uh, what are the dangers of of not adapting? Did you get the question? Yeah, 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 I know I get it. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question, hello? and I don't. Yeah, hello. Do you, do you hear me? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I did get your question. Yes, um, it's an interesting but also difficult question. Um, I think we are in the middle of a process where we can um, really watch our institutions adapt or not adapt, or um, you know. Um, institutions are always. Um, you know, we will always fight for the problem that they were invented for, right? That is was what uh, Clay Shirky once said. So um, uh, an institution will always keep doing what it's doing, even though it is um, um, not beneficial to society anymore. And I, and I think that is what we are seeing at the moment uh, right now when the politi political institutions in the digital realm really fight to re-establish capitalism with um, all uh, power that they really struggle for, right? You can see it uh, in Germany or in the US where the governments um, really try to 
um, push intellectual property rights further and further and further and to uh, make the restrictions um, um, are more enforced and so on. This is, an, this is all attempts to uh, keep uh, the institutions of capitalism in place um, and um, you can see that um, they are doing that because uh, this is what they meant to do and that that's what they were invented to do and um, and I think this is um, this is an interesting pro pro uh, process which will lead um, um, I don't know which will lead to some um, new monster, maybe is some some new synergy, as uh, Hegel would say. Right, right. You have one force and you have an opposing force, and a thesis and an antithesis, and uh, then you have a synthesis at the end, um, which will be just a new uh, another monster, right? Um, and um, I'm uh, at that moment not really. I don't feel. Um, uh, I don't feel that I can predict things really good right now because it's uh, we're in the middle of this process but um uh, i think it's worth watching june did michael answer your questions okay i think um I lost June here, but uh, Michael, would you like to continue with your closing statement in two or three sentences? Yes, it was a, a real pleasure to talk with you and to exchange ideas. And I think uh, we really uh, got to the uh, point here, which is um, um, where um, the future regulations of um, AI and tech digital technology should take place. And I think there is absolutely a place for privacy and uh, data protection. But I think there's also uh, there should also be more emphasis on uh, higher level um, regulation, higher level um, uh, scrutinies and, uh, and, and powers. Thank you. Um, Katharina? Yeah, from, from, my point, from my point of view, um, it's very important that we don't forget to imagine a different world. Yeah, but this sounds maybe naive, but sometimes I have the impression that people think that the status quo of technology, of companies, of yeah, digitalization is like the only possible way how things could turn out. But in fact, many many structures are not based on technology or like enforced by technology, but enforced by business models. And that's why I re really think that um, we should never forget that um, it lies in our power to change, uh, whether or not we think that certain business models are healthy for our society or not. And um, companies like um, Google, Facebook, and yeah, data brokers, so on, they, they want us to believe that we can't do anything about this, that like this is the way things work now in the new century. But um, I don't think it's the case. I think that people are far more powerful than they think they are. And if we decide to fight for privacy, then this will be a human right and enforced worldwide. Thank you. We should take our rights and power back in the um, era of digitalization. Alia. Okay. Um, there's this saying which goes that um, if you're not paying for it, you become the product, which translates to because social media is free, um, it comes at a price and privacy is the price. And I strongly disagree with this because if we have a strong comprehensive data protections, regulations, as uh, supported with other sectoral regulations, we would be able to take control of our data in social media and other uh, digital space. And especially considering that the way in which a data is used in modern political campaigning is highly invasive and it has the potential to undermine our democracy. And um, there is the complex and opaque uh, corporate 
uh, advertising ecosystem behind targeted uh, political uh, advertising and if these companies continue to collect and process sensitive data without limitations and safeguards it would lead to serious risk and is prone to abuse therefore um, information is power and data protections is a tool to control it Thank you. So, yeah, we're not trading um, the co in the convenience that we get with our data. Um, last but not least, June, are you um, still there with us? Can you hear me? June? Uh, you, you are muted. Oops, again. Okay, I did that mistake. Sorry. I think I lost June. June, can you hear me? Okay, unfortunately, I think um, I lost June um, here. But um, again, to close our session, to end our session, um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers and all of our participants for today. It's been a very fruitful discussion. I think that's all we have um, for today. Again, um, thank you. Hope to see you in another discussion and have a nice weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice to meet you, everyone. Michael, Katarina, Madia.